Welcome everyone to the We Can Do This podcast, Kiss the Ground's weekly conversation about how you can participate in the healing of ourselves and our earth as we are one in the same. My name is Rylan Engelhart. I will be your host and it is a great, great honor to be here uh, not only with one guest, but two guests today. Uh, one is Don Smith, who has been a team member of Kiss the Ground for many, many years. He's been one of our most loyal and uh, amazing participants in the organization since almost inception. And we, uh, I, I love the story that we were uh, some 20 something year olds in a, in a house in Venice, very inspired about soil and we invited Don to come and talk about uh, worms and vermicompost and he showed up and uh, did an amazing presentation and we were enamored by his presentation about worms and he was just as enamored that we were enamored by his presentation in worms. And um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a joy to have you on the team, Don. Thank you for your dedication, devotion. And uh, we actually made a request to our team uh, who are some of your favorite people in the regenerative movement? And Don uh, recommended John, and I'm going to give pass the baton to Don to introduce John, our amazing uh, guest for today's podcast. So thank you, Don, for joining us in this conversation. And I pass you the baton. All right. Thank you, Ryland. So I've been uh, somewhat of a voracious reader about all kinds of uh, cool things and regenerative ag and worm composting and compost and growing healthy food, et cetera. And of all the people that are out there, I found John Kemp to be, you know, one of the thought leaders in this movement. And yet a lot of people have never heard of his name, unfortunately. And I'm here to help spread that message. He's probably one of the most well-read, well-studied people in the regenerative agriculture movement. And he looks very far afield from just standard agronomists and is always looking for different information that helps, um, helps us grow healthier food. So John's just amazing and he synthesizes really complex ideas and puts it in layman's terms, because most people don't want to hear about cations and anions, et cetera. But when he explains things, he can take it to whatever level of complexity you need, but he can also keep it really simple. And it's just, he's got a great skill, um, ability to communicate, and his lectures are always packed. Wherever, whatever conference he goes to, they're standing room only. It's amazing. So great stuff. So glad to have you here, John. I just want to clear up one thing. The reason normally these are broadcast live, but because of your tradition, we just like to hear a little bit about um, the reason that we're doing an audio without the video. It would be great if you could explain it to our audience, just so that people understand um, the, whole, the whole concept. Well, thank you, Don and Rylan. That was quite the introduction, and it's certainly an honor to be here. The, I grew up in an Amish community and I'm still a member of the Amish community here in Northeast Ohio. And within that tradition, they generally are opposed to photography and videography of, uh, of people actually being recorded um, and their image being shared. So for that reason, uh, this is why I'm, on my podcast, it's audio only and uh, I'm very passionate about sharing the information that we've developed but um, I try to stay off camera as much as possible. And I've actually found um, initially there, were, there was the idea and the perception um, from some of my colleagues that this might be a weakness. And I've actually found that there's a bit of uh, fun, mystery, and intrigue of being the guy that's off the camera all the time. So I really enjoy it. <laughs> Fantastic. Love it. it. And John, just so I can understand at a little deeper, I imagine that there's some philosophical um, reason for, uh, I, I made up in my mind a couple different ideas of why they don't want image captured or, and I was just curious, um, what is the sort of philosophical idea around not having our image captured or shared? 
Well, it comes from the uh, historical uh, Judeo-Christian worldview and uh, perspective that the Anabaptist and Amish community really uh, came from and originated from. And the idea was the is their translation or their interpretation of one of the Ten Commandments, which says, thou shalt have no graven image before me. And so their interpretation of that is since, since we are built in God's image, then we should have no images of ourselves that are out there that are circulating around that we can refer to. Mm. That's um, beautiful. I, my only distraction was that you were breaking up a little bit on the audio. Um, and so uh, you said that you are recording a hard audio. Uh, okay, cool. So it, we'll, we'll have beautiful, awesome. Thank you for that. All right, great. Now we can get to the real meat of this. Can you describe what regenerative agriculture means to you? I believe that the way regenerative agriculture conversation is being framed today is commonly focused on regenerating soil health. And that isn't particularly incorrect, but I believe it most certainly is incomplete. And we really should be, if we go for the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal in my, from my perspective is that we should seek to regenerate public health and ecosystem health. So we should seek to regenerate the entire ecosystem of the planet, the globe, what that means for all these different organisms, uh, wild plants and animals and rivers and streams and so forth. And then recognizing that we are one of the organisms within this ecosystem. And one of the metrics that we can use to evaluate regeneration of ecosystem health is regeneration of public health. We know that we have this, uh, we have a public health crisis on our hands right now where if we keep going down the pathway that we're on, then we will cripple the United States economy and the economy of many developed countries around the world simply from increasing healthcare costs due to degenerative illnesses. And these degenerative illnesses are fundamentally I believe an agricultural problem. Farmers and growers can do more than doctors and hospitals from a public health perspective because they have the capacity to grow nutritious food that can prevent people from becoming ill. Doctors and hospitals don't prevent people from becoming ill. They only treat the illnesses after they occur. So um, from, from my perspective, regenerative agriculture the, the ultimate objective of regenerative agriculture should be to regenerate plant health so that we have plants that are resistant to diseases and insects and eliminate the need for pesticides, that regenerate soil health, which then contributes to regenerating ecosystem health and ultimately regenerates our own health as a human population around the globe at the same time. So regenerative agriculture really should, I believe, take a much bigger perspective than simply the perspective of regenerating soil health and building soil organic matter. The conversation deserves to be much bigger than that. Awesome, fantastic. And one one, one follow-up just on, has regenerative agriculture always been the word that you've used for describing agriculture that's uh, increasing uh, biological life on land, or is that a relatively new term that, because I know there's a lot of views on where that term comes from, and um, so I'm just curious on how you, how, where you perceive that term coming in. It's not a new term for us, and I know there's other people in this space, but it's not a new term for earlier on. I first started advancing eco-agriculture in 2006, and we use the terms of ecological agriculture or biological agriculture, which is really where the name of advancing eco-agriculture came from, was the intent for the word, for the syllable eco, was to represent both ecological and economical agriculture. But then we chose very deliberately in 2011, we chose to begin using the word regenerative agriculture. So. Uh, there have been other people who've been using that word in this space, but I think um, we've we've certainly helped to popularize it and bring it to the mainstream, at least for the farming audience that we work with. And I believe the word itself is is very words are powerful, and the concept is extremely important. Before the popularity of regenerative agriculture, which has really 
exploded in the last three years in particular, and uh, very recently. Before that, the quote unquote fad of the day was sustainability and sustainable agriculture. And I made the point then that we should have no desire to sustain where we are in agriculture. What is it that we're really trying to sustain? We first need to have a conversation about a regenerative agriculture that regenerates soil health, regenerates plant health, and grows plants that are resistant to disease and insect performance, uh, resistant to diseases and insects, and has extremely high yields of high quality food. Once we've achieved this much higher plateau of performance, at that point, and only at that point, can we have a conversation about true sustainability? An ecosystem or an, an agricultural management system that is constantly reliant on external inputs of fertilizers and pesticides cannot be defined as sustainable from a global context. Yes, we, we, we've had a very similar idea and um, communication around that sustainability is ahead of its time because to sustain something that's been degenerated or sustain something that's already broken uh, is totally doesn't make sense. Why would we want to sustain that? So I, I, I love, I love um, hearing uh, reflections of similar insights that are just emerging in different times and spaces, um, but in, in, in similar ways. It's awesome. Don, so, yeah, yeah, go yeah. for it. So, um, what was your big aha moment that started you down this, this path of learning about regenerative agriculture or just how plants grow in particular? Oh my, there have been several. Um, the, the first significant aha moment that really changed my pathway, um, I, it's important, I think, for context to understand that I didn't just gradually grow into the con concepts of regenerative agriculture and producing healthy plants. I was from the opposite side of the tracks. My father was a pesticide distributor for the local region. I grew up on a family fruit and vegetable farm. Uh, I was a licensed private pesticide applicator when I was 16 years old. And as a result of my father being the local distributor, we were the first people to try all the newest, latest and greatest cocktails and then make recommendations to our customers on how well they were working for us. So I was really embedded in that system and understood it quite well, um, very well. I studied pesticide modes of action and how they worked. And um, then later on, I also went on to study how they influence the human organism, which is a really scary topic if you really start getting into it. Um, and then in the early 2000s, 2002, three and four, we had a three year consecutive period of very challenging weather conditions. We were in the snow belt south of Lake Erie, so we have high humidity and lots of rainfall, lots of disease and insect pressure. And in those, in that three year period, we lost over 70% of our crops, three consecutive years, to a variety of different diseases and insects that we were unsuccessful in controlling and managing with ever increasing pesticide applications. And this led, understandably, to a lot of frustration. I still remember making the comment to my dad that I might as well do nothing for nothing as do something for nothing, because it seemed the pesticides were being largely ineffective. Then in 2004, the third year of this three-year period, we rented a field from a neighboring farm that bordered right up against one of our own fields. So on our own field that we've been farming for the prior decade, we've had vegetables every year, year after year, with pesticide applications every summer, and then a cover crop during the winter months. So we were doing cover crops and, and some of those practices, but it was still very intense pesticide applications every year. The neighboring field had been in a dairy farm, um, corn, small grain, and hay rotation with manure applications, some limestone applications, and very minimal fertilizer applications and almost non-existent pesticides. These fields used to be two long, narrow strips. And because they were quite narrow, they were being tilled up and down the slope and planted up and down the slope, which was not ideal. Now that we were farming both fields, we switched the direction of planting and tilling, and we started planting crops across the field border. This field was right out beside the road where everyone could see it driving by. And on the old section, we planted this field in 2004 into cantaloupe. On the old section, 
that we've been farming for the prior decade, at harvest time, 80% of the leaves were infected with powdery mildew and it almost cost us the crop. On the new section that had been in the dairy farm rotation, there was no powdery mildew. There was this knife line right down where the former field border had been that you could clearly see the divide of the section that was infected versus sec the section that was not infected. And yet it had been managed the same. It was the same variety, planted the same day, fertilized in the same way, but two completely different outcomes. And that was the first significant aha moment that really led me to ask the question, what are the differences between these two plants? And what allows one plant to be resistant to powder and mildew when the next plant a yard away is susceptible? It was so pronounced that there were actually healthy vines growing right in among the unhealthy vines. They were intertwined into each other. So it was not a question of the pathogen not being present, mm -hmm. but the plants expressed themselves completely differently. So that was the first significant aha moment that really got me started down a different pathway of realizing that plants have immune systems and can be resistant to diseases and then resistant to insects. And then the second significant aha moment was the realization that when we have these regenerative systems that regenerate plant immunity and plant health and soil health, we also are growing plants that have high concentrations of medicinal compounds that, and immune compounds that enhance our own immune systems and we can have a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine. The realization that we can have an agriculture that regenerates soil health and regenerates plant health and regenerates human health all at the same time, I found to be incredibly inspiring. And this is why my personal mission is to have these agriculture models become the mainstream globally in the next couple of decades. Hopefully wow. soon. <laughs> I, I, I am totally lit up and inspired. I, I, I am, <laughs> wow, really, really amazing, amazing. Just your articulation is beautiful and speaking right to my heart so thank you for that i had i had one question that came up in my mind which was um in in amish communities you know in my mind which is kind of naive and uneducated around you know that tradition but i i was thinking that there's kind of a a natural element to you know amish communities and that pesticides you know synthetic fertilizers wouldn't be um you know, typically used within Amish communities. Again, that was completely, you know, fictitious coming out of my mind, but I'm just curious, is there within the Amish communities more of a, a, a natural approach to agriculture or is that not the case at all? That is a popular and unfortunately incorrect misconception. Um, okay. The uh, this has been a recurring conversation. I've, I've been asked this, this very exact question many times over the years. And um, I would say that I would describe the Amish communities in general. This is obviously sweeping with broad brush strokes and everyone is an individual. But in general, the Amish culture is to be fairly intense at whatever approach that you take. So there are many farmers who, many Amish farmers who, they were very trusting of authority figures in governments and within academia. And um, they adopted GMOs and they adopted pesticides. I mean, they went in 100%, no holes barred, no holding back, because this was all supposed to be safe. And then there certainly were elements of the community that have taken a more conservative approach and a more natural approach, but it, um, the community really is composed of individuals and there are people across the spectrum, just like there are in the community at large. Got it. Uh, so if regenerative agriculture can produce, you know, such better results and even better economic results, why do you think the adoption of this methodology is so slow? Oh, this is a really fun conversation and a uh, fun question and one that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and asking other people about. And I think there are a number of contributing factors. I mean, we could generate a long list with a little conversation, but I think some of the most significant contributing factors to why adoption is slow is, um, first is the very human characteristic of, uh, just the general human characteristic of being slow to change. 
uh, change, uh, something that is new and that is unusual is, uh, there's, there's a lot of unfamiliarity. This is for many farmers today, farmers who've been farming for 50 years or longer, some of our a very older generation still recognizes this from 50 years ago, so, or some of these practices. So for them, it's not particularly new, but there is, uh, for a large part of our farming population, these ideas and practices are relatively new. They're unfamiliar. And so that unfamiliarity produces a lot of hesitation. And then in addition, there is the factor that these regenerative management systems generally include a lot of cultural management shifts. You might time your planting differently, or maybe you need to prune differently. You need to control weeds a little bit differently. And it is often more management intense. It doesn't lend itself to farming 10,000 acres quite as easily. Um, and so there is that learning and information shift. But then I think one influence that is very close to the top of the list is concern about what friends and neighbors will say. What are the people at the coffee shop and at, shirt, at church and in the local community? What, are, what is my family going to think? What are my neighbors going to think? Um, that is a very, very significant influencing factor for many people. I think it's, it's, it's human. It's, it's true for all of us. We all care about the opinions of the people around us. And so recognizing that, I think if we recognize and acknowledge that, that can actually be very powerful for people who desire to, to make this change because now they can consciously choose to surround themselves with like-minded people and say, that I don't, uh, I do care about the opinions of the people in my family and my neighborhood and church and so forth. And I also care about the opin opinions of um, other regenerative farmers and make a conscious effort to connect with a group of like-minded people, to create your own peer network, to give you the support that you need and the encouragement that you need through the difficult moments that are certain to come in any endeavor. Great. And do you think if, do we need government to change its policies to, do you think that would have an impact? Is that, it, or would it, would it be better if the government stayed out of it completely? Um, that's a very question. <laughs> so could the government influence the adoption of regenerative agriculture? Yes, it most certainly could. Does it have the, um, the ability, the execution ability to actually bring that about? And should we look to government? I, in my opinion is that uh, change very often happens in spite of government policies and not because of them. And I think there certainly are policies in place today that limit the adoption of regenerative agriculture. And there are some that could be put in place that would dramatically speed the adoption of regenerative agriculture. So it is certainly an avenue where significant change could be produced if there was the collective will and desire to produce it. I don't see that environment existing at this moment in history. And I would be happy to be mistaken. Um, so my general message and approach and the way that the farmers that we work with is that we seek to produce change um, in all political contexts, regardless of what the policies and, and uh, governmental regs might be in a, in a local situation. And John, what do you see as the reason that in over the last three years, there's been a bloom uh, or a expansion of the adoption and the, you know, even the mental awareness of this um, promise or possibility of regenerative agriculture. The bloom, as you expressed it, uh, and, and the interest in regenerative agriculture within broadacre crops in, in the America Midwest and the Plains regions has come as an unexpected surprise for me. When, when I started advancing eco-agriculture and then became inspired by the capacity of, of these regenerative agriculture management systems. I've 
stated it many times that my, my mission is to see these regenerative agriculture practices become the mainstream globally, the status quo against which everything else is compared by 2040. That's in 20 years from now. And I believe that this is a very achievable and very realistic goal and that we're well on the pathway to achieving this goal. But I've tried to be very specific and very strategic about how do we get there from here, from where we are today. And 10 years ago, I believed that um, the answer to that question was that we would first begin working with the innovators and the early adopters, uh, those people with that mentality and mindset who had a higher appetite for risk and so forth. And I believed that those growers, those producers, would mostly be the high value fruit and vegetable crop producers because in many cases, there are many innovations that happen there that then begin moving into broad acre crops a decade or so later. And it's also how we have the most immediate and most direct impact on the quality of the food that people eat. But I was wrong. And I've, I was wrong in that the surge in popularity of the regenerative agricultural models and ideas have become so popular in the Midwest so quickly. And in trying to understand that, researching that, I've come to learn that People make this shift, we as farmers make this shift from mainstream practices to regenerative practices in two very different pathways. 60% of growers begin uh, or become open-minded to farming differently as a result of some personal crisis. It could be a health crisis in the family, it can be a crisis, an economic crisis on the farm, or a crop crisis on the farm. It can be any number of different directions that this can come from, but it's some sort of personal crisis that triggers the realization that I can't keep doing what I'm doing and expect to get in a different place. Mm. And then the other 40% kind of make this gradual transition as a result many times of social changes in their peer network. And so I believe what has happened in agriculture mainstream agriculture in the American Midwest and the Plains states for the last couple of years is that a large number of growers, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, have smacked their heads against the proverbial brick wall. And that has led to an openness to innovation and new ideas that didn't exist before them. And this also, when we think about the future of agriculture, there are many farmers who are very challenged financially. We have lots of farm bankruptcies and um, dairy farms going out of business. And that is very saddening. And I'm, I'm very sympathetic and empathetic with those growers and producers. And at the same moment, we have growers producing the exact same things who are extremely profitable and who are making a lot of money because they've adopted regenerative agriculture practices. So it really is, I think this, this crisis can bring about the birth of new opportunities and perhaps a shift in the agricultural models that are the status quo. Yes. All right. Um, so I'm going to shift gears slightly and talk about something that you call your plant health pyramid and why plant, healthy plants are resistant to pests and diseases. Could, could you go into and elaborate on your plant health pyramid? The plant health pyramid is really at the foundation. It's one of the foundational concepts that we developed and that I've spoken a lot about. And the foundational idea behind the plant health pyramid is that plants have an immune system much, that functions much the same as ours. Uh, plants also have neural networks that function much the same as ours. In fact, they have the same neurotransmitters, it's serotonin and melatonin and so forth that we do, which is a whole other fascinating conversation. But uh, in, the, in the context of plant immunity, we understand that each one of us have our own immune systems, but they don't all work equally well. We become ill. Some people become ill to the first cold and flu bug that comes along, and other people practically never become ill. And the difference between those two is how well their immune system, that is their microbiome and, and everything that comprises their immune system, has been supported with nutrition over the course of their entire lifetime, in fact, from even before they were born. And this same concept also holds true for plants. Plants also have their own inherent immune systems. 
they have the capacity to be completely resistant to all diseases and all insects when they are supported with the right nutrition and the right biology. And I know that that sentence that I just said is a very significant statement. It's a very big statement. To claim that you can produce crops that are resistant to all diseases and all insects is a very big claim. It's not one that I make lightly. I know from in-field experience that we can produce crops that are resistant to every disease and every insect, including locusts. So if you can have a conversation about developing a crop that is resistant to locusts in Africa, you can have a conversation about a broad other array. And so I'm, I make that comment and make that statement based on actually achieving and delivering those results on hundreds of thousands of acres across dozens of different crops all across North America and some foreign countries as well. So the plant health pyramid is a diagram that we developed to describe how we observe plants becoming resistant to different groups of diseases and different groups of insects based on what was happening within plant physiology and that the level of that plant's nutritional integrity and the plant's microbiome integrity. So uh, there are four different levels in the plant health pyramid. Um, the first level is when they develop, uh, when they have strong photosynthesis, uh, I, what I call complete photosynthesis, which means that they now produce both more quantities of sugars and photosynthate, photosynthates every day and also a higher quality of sugars and photosynthates. At this stage, the plants become resistant to all the soil-borne fungal pathogens, such as Fusarium and Verticillium and Rhizoctonia and Pythium and so forth. The second stage is when plants begin forming complete proteins and they no longer have the soluble nitrogen forms, nitrates and some soluble forms of amino acids in the plant sap that are required by some insects as a food source. So for all these, this group of insects, which would include um, aphids and white flies and leaf hoppers and all the larval insects such as uh, cabbage looper and tomato hornworm and corn earworm and so forth, for all these larvae, they require soluble forms of nitrogen in the plant sap. When you change the way you manage plant nutrition, it's possible to have a plant that has an abundant level of protein, even uh, extremely high levels of protein, but no soluble levels of nitrates or some of these amino acids in the profile. And now you've removed the food source for these, all these insect pests. So this is, these first two levels of the pyramid are what I refer to as passive immunity. We're simply removing the food source that the organism requires in order to sustain itself and to feed itself. The second two levels of the plant health pyramid are um, when the plants, the third level is when plants have a highly functioning microbiome and they begin absorbing the majority of their nutrition in the form of microbial metabolites. They get this glossy waxy sheen on the leaf surface when they have surplus energy and they store this surplus energy in the form of fats and oils. They get this glossy waxy sheen on the leaf surface and now they become resistant to all the airborne fungal and bacterial pathogens, downy and powdery mildew, uh, bacterial infectious diseases, and so forth. And then finally, the fourth level at the peak of the pyramid is when plants begin producing high levels of these plant secondary metabolites, phytoalexins, terpenoids, um, all these various aromatic compounds that plants produce as plant protectants to protect themselves from ultraviolet radiation, from insect attack, disease attack, overgrazing, you may recognize some of these compounds such as uh, resveratrol in red wine, um, anthocyanins in blueberries, uh, lycopene in tomatoes. These are all plant secondary metabolites that are at the foundation of these plants' immune systems. And we know that they can also enhance, many of these can also enhance our own immune systems. So at this last stage, this fourth stage in the plant health pyramid, this is when fruit develops extraordinary flavor and aroma. They're extremely flavorful. And these plants now also become resistant to all of the insects with more difficult digestive systems, or I should say more complex digestive systems, such as uh, the beetle family, uh, marmorated stink bug and uh, Colorado potato beetle, adults, and Japanese beetles and, and cucumber beetles and corn rootworm beetles and so forth. So um, there's a lot of science and information behind the plant health pyramid. Um, and I've, 
we've actually put a course together on our academy online. There's also a couple of YouTube clips. So it is something that's really worth getting into and understanding a bit more deeply. And we've put lots of resources online where people can learn more about the Planet Health Pyramid. Yeah, I highly recommend the course. It's, it's awesome. Um, so I've heard you mention this many times um, about farmers should really focus on maximizing photosynthesis, both farmers and ranchers, and that should be like their highest priority. Can you go into that a little bit and how that's um, related to the genetic potential of a plant? Again, such fun conversations. Um, <laughs> there has been this, I believe, incorrect framework in the organic and regenerative agriculture community to emphasize soil health, to say that we need to build soil health and uh, the pathway to building soil health is by growing cover crops and by adding compost and uh, keeping our soils covered and incorporating livestock, et cetera. I don't disagree with any of those things. Um, I think they are all accurate and correct, but they, I believe they miss the fundamental point, which is that the process of photosynthesis is the only way we have of bringing new energy into the ecosystem. It's the only way that we can efficiently and effectively capture carbon and store it in the soil. Um, if we import carbon in the form of compost and manure and other things, then we're not tapping into what we can achieve with, with growing plants. So what I've come to realize as I've studied this, in, in this pathway that I was on of uh, starting with the observation, the experiences on the farm that I grew up on, sort of thinking about, okay, plants have the capacity to have this tremendous immunity. Why does this not exist? And what's the pathway to getting there? And I realized that for many crops, many crops don't have the capacity, they, they never develop a functional immune system because they are so low in energy. They are chronically sick because they're not photosynthesizing well enough. And what we have come to accept as common and normal today is plants which are photosynthesizing somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15 to 20 percent of their inherent photosynthetic capacity. So that means that every day in each 24-hour photo period they are only photosynthesizing at less than a fifth of what they're capable of. They're producing much fewer sugars, fewer energy, they're sequestering only a fraction of the carbon that they're capable of. And this is slowing down the entire ecosystem. And so it seemed to me that the pathway to, um, I'll call it hacking the system, the pathway to hacking this biological system and accelerate, or I should say accelerating the system is to speed up photosynthesis. If we can go from 20% to 60%, then we can triple the quantity of sugars that is being produced in that plant in each 24 hour photo period and triple the overall ecosystem's performance. So I spent a lot of time thinking about what are the limiting factors that limit photosynthesis? How can we increase it? And then of course, how can we incentivize this for our growers and our producers? And this speaks to the, the associated question that you ask is how does this connect with genetic potential? In the late 1970s, 1977 or 78, there was a uh, biochemical geneticist at Iowa State University named Charles Tsai. Charles has since passed on. I would have loved to interview him, but um, he was the first geneticist to calculate the genetic potential of the corn plant. And he described that all the corn genetics available at that moment in time had the genetic capacity to produce 1,100 bushel per acre. And more recently, other geneticists have said that modern day genetics have the capacity to significantly more, as much as 15 to 1,600 bushels per acre. Average yield across North America is something, I think 155 bushels or something like that we're harvesting only a fraction of what that plant is capable of. And the reason, fundamentally, is because these plants are not photosynthesizing well enough. It's really that simple. There is this direct connection between genetic potential and photosynthetic potential. That we're harvesting 15 to 20% of a plant's genetic potential of many of our commercial crop species, and we're only harvesting 15 to 20% uh, or we are only, these plants are only at 15 to 20% of photosynthetic capacity. So the, what this means in essence is 
uh, we already know from field experience on many acres, tens of thousands of acres, is that it's not an unrealistic expectation to expect to double or triple photosynthesis. That means it's not an unrealistic expectation to get significantly higher yields, 30%, 40%, 50% higher yields. We have already experienced this and done this on a commercial scale on many high value fruit and vegetable crops. And the same capacity exists on broad acre crops as well. And so this, this then speaks directly to the conversation of how are we going to feed a growing world population? Well, I can tell you that we're not going to significantly expand or increase our efficiency efficiency by using more pesticides, more fertilizers. The answer lies in increasing photosynthesis. And that ultimately, there's one more point that is important, is that when you grow these, there's this idea that to build soil organic matter, we need to grow cover crops and we need to do all these various things. But in reality, fundamentally, you can build organic matter while you are growing a crop. You can build organic matter while you are growing corn. In fact, back in the 70s, much of the agronomic literature of the day reported that the fastest way to build organic matter was to grow corn. Today, we have the idea that the fastest way to extract organic matter is to grow corn. And the only difference is in how we manage the ecosystems today versus the way that they were managed in the 20s and 30s. Uh, and even before that, there certainly were some damaging uh, management practices back then as well. So the reality is that we can grow these really healthy crops that are resistant to diseases and insects, that provide food as medicine, and that regenerate soil health and build organic matter while we are growing a crop. We can do that while we're growing wheat, while we're growing oats, uh, doesn't matter. All plants have the capacity to do this. Awesome. Wow. That's going to open a lot of people's minds because I love how you can say it because you've actually done it. It's, it's awesome. Um, so uh, talking about soil organic matter, can you explain why building soil organic matter is so important and how a robust soil microbiome is critical to the process? This is another, uh, another fun, uh, fun question. So, um, actually, can you repeat that question once sure, more? Sure, sure. It, it's, um, and, can you explain? Don, yeah. Don, I had one, I had one follow-up to the, before you do a whole new question, I just had one follow-up to the last uh, question, which is, so most people think that you, you have to do application of compost, cover crops, you know, you have to do these additional things to build soil organic matter um, where you're saying, you know, and there's kind of a, a perspective that growing corn is an extractive, fundamentally an extractive crop, but you're saying that we actually can be growing um, a, a crop such as corn, that we can be producing food as medicine, we can produce more yield, and we can be pumping carbon um, and restoring soil health. And my question is, what, what's the blind spot that we're not seeing why there's even in, in the perspective of possibility of regenerative agriculture, people are seeing we need to do these additional things. And you're saying we can do it actually doing the thing that is most wanting to be grown on most of the acres of this, this country. Yeah, so I'm not a fan of production. Um, so I should express that opinion up front, but I, I will use corn as an example because it's uh, perhaps the example that has been the most well studied and well documented. Um, it is possible to build organic matter while growing corn on corn year after year. We actually have farmers who have done this, who've gained uh, a growing corn on corn year after year, multiple consecutive years, and uh, gaining an average of a half a point of organic matter per year on a typical soil analysis. So significant organic matter gains. and. Uh, the pathway to achieving that outcome is simply by increasing the plant's photosynthesis. So this is the blind spot that you asked about. The blind spot is that everyone assumes that photosynthesis has a certain set level that is called normal, and that is what it is. And that isn't the case at all. It's very common. I'll, I'll uh, continue with corn as an example. Um, and this also speaks to the question about why is organic matter important? Um, 
we know that for a plant to photosynthesize, kind of the, the macro ingredients that are needed are that you need to have adequate sunlight, you need to have adequate water, and you need to have adequate carbon dioxide and chlorophyll in the leaf. Uh, along, and, and I would add to that list manganese specifically for water hydrolysis. That is the one nutrient that merits being mentioned on its own. So when you look at this from a macro perspective, it's common for us as farmers and growers to think about, okay, it's usually water that is the limiting factor. That's what we've become acclimated to thinking of water is the fact that limits photosynthesis. But in fact, in most of commercial production agriculture, it's not water, it's carbon dioxide that is the limiting factor. When you have a green corn, growing corn crop on a late June or early July day in the Midwest, um, the background atmospheric carbon dioxide is somewhere in the neighborhood, let's say of 400 parts per million. And there is a very slight flush of carbon dioxide that emerges from the soil early in the morning. And usually it is common in many agricultural fields, particularly if they're surrounded by cornfields for miles and miles, is that this growing corn crop will deplete the carbon dioxide levels in the air from 400 parts per million down to less than 100 parts per million by nine or 10 o'clock in the morning. That means that for the rest of the day, it doesn't matter if you have perfect water and perfect sunlight and a dark green plant with chlorophyll to intercept all of it, the limiting factor for photosynthesis from 10 a.m. until 7 p.m. is CO2. So this also speaks to the question is why is organic matter important? Um, if we ask that question, we can get lots of correct answers. We, say, we can say that organic matter is important because it increases water infiltration and water holding capacity and it, it provides a substrate to increase our microbial populations. All of those are good answers. But I believe the biggest answer, if we, and the best answer, if we want to accelerate the system's performance, is that we need to have high organic matter soils so that we can cycle it, so that we can lose carbon as carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and increase the plant's photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide or carbon isn't meant to be static in the soil. We shouldn't just have a conversation about sequestering carbon. Our goal as farmers should be to cycle more carbon. We want to sequester more and release more as CO2 as a result of microbial respiration for the next green growing plants to absorb. This is really why organic matter is so important to increasing. And, and, and the key point in all of this, you could say, well, that if you want to cycle more, does that mean that the atmospheric levels remain the same? Uh, and the answer is it doesn't. Uh, they don't remain the same. They do actually drop, but that's another broader conversation. But there's, there are very imp there's one very important um, side effect, if you could call it that, which is that when you cycle more carbon through the ecosystem, you significantly increase yields and you significantly increase quality and health. As a result of increasing photosynthesis, you raise the entire ecosystem's level of performance. And even though you're you're cycling the same quantity of carbon in the total ecosystem, the reality is you're holding more in the soil as a part of that total cycle, and you're increasing the overall ecosystem's performance. That is really the objective, and I think that is the blind spot, as you described it, is that we have assumed that photosynthesis is a constant, and it's not a constant. Excellent. Wow, that's... That's a whole new. That's a whole new story that I haven't uh, been privy to. I, um, thank you for that. You're missing out, Ryland. Yeah. It's... So, um, hence why John's on the show. And uh, could you also talk a little bit about how that microbiome is key for the plant health as as well? What are all those microbes in the soil that are eating those photosynthates? What are What are they doing for plant health? There's so many dots that to tie in to answer your question. Um, so the microbiome is critical. Uh, it's fundamental for plants to get to higher levels of plant health, level three and level four on the plant health pyramid. And there's kind of this chicken and egg question of which comes first, the, the plant microbiome or the soil microbiome or the plant's capacity to support it. 
And I believe, again, that the answer, the source, is photosynthesis. That's how you bring new energy into the system. So let's talk first about how we sustain large microbial populations. The first is that, um, or the, the way that you sustain a very large microbial population is obviously they need to have a very large food source, much larger than what could, again, be considered normal or common. And when you increase a plant's photosynthesis from, let's say, for the sake of discussion, 20% to 60%, you triple the quantity of sugars produced in every 24-hour photo period. But it would be a rare crop for which that translates to triple yield. It's not common to see 300% yield increases. Um, you might get a 30% yield increase or a 50% yield increase. And on some crops, it's, everything is context dependent. So uh, the question that we then need to ask is, if this plant has produced three times more sugars, but the quantity of sugars in the crop has only increased by 30% or by 50%, then where did all the remaining sugars go? And the answer is, they went down into the root system. We have larger root systems and larger root biomass, and we also have a significantly higher percentage of the total photosynthates that were sent out through the roots as root exudates to feed soil biology. So when you consider carbon partitioning and sugar partitioning of where the carbon flows in, in these different ecosystems, there are dramatic differences based on the level of plant health. The healthier a plant becomes, the more it photosynthesizes, the higher a percentage of the total photosynthates are actually sent out through the root systems as root exudates. And so you have this compounding effect, this flywheel effect of rapidly regenerating soil health. So this is how you sustain a large microbial population. But then why is this microbial population particularly important? Because there are, let me offer some context first. Plant nutrition. Plants absorb, have the capacity to absorb nutrients in two forms. The one form that mainstream, what is present day mainstream agriculture and has been mainstream since Justice von Liebig in the last 100 years. Uh, this model of agronomy and plant nutrition is predicated on the idea that plants have the capacity to absorb simple ions, calcium ions, magnesium ions, potassium ions, and so forth from the soil solution. We now, it has been postulated and described since the 60s and 50s in the literature, and, and even before that, to some degree, that plants also have the capacity to absorb entire living microbial cells and use the energy and the nutrients contained within their cells to form their own bodies. So there have been fascinating research done on endocytosis, the plant, the capacity of plants to absorb large molecules since the 70s, and most recently it has been uh, Dr. James White's work at Rutgers University on what he describes as the rhizophagy process, where he describes the capacity of, of how plants actually absorb entire living organisms from the soil and extract nutrients from these living organisms themselves. So these are two very different models of plant nutrition, and in practice, they largely oppose each other. It's very difficult to have both of them functioning in soils at optimal levels at the same time. When you, and so mainstream agronomy is based on this idea that we're going to put out water soluble fertilizers, water soluble ions that the plants can absorb. The new agronomy, the agronomy of the future is based on not having plants absorb simple ions, but instead having plants absorb living bacteria and microorganisms and extract energy and the needed nutrients that they need from those microorganisms. So this is a very important difference between the two and it is fundamental to producing the degree of plant health and immunity that I spoke about in the context of the plant health pyramid. And here's why. There, is, there are completely different levels of energy that are contributed to or extracted from the plant from these different sources of nutrients. So uh, let's use nitrogen as an example because it's well described in the fundamental biochemistry interactions. When a plant absorbs nitrate nitrogen, which is the water soluble ion that is most present in soils in mainstream agriculture systems, 
when a plant absorbs nitrate, it requires a tremendous amount of photosynthetic energy, sugar energy, to convert nitrate to proteins. And it also requires a lot of water. It requires three molecules of water for every molecule of nitrate for the conversion process. So the simple way of saying it is to say that when a plant absorbs nitrate, it consumes a lot of energy to transfer the nitrate to proteins. And for an average plant, if there is such a thing, but a plant that's at 20% photosynthetic capacity on a corn plant, if a corn plant cons absorbs 80% of its nitrogen in the form of nitrate, it requires 16% of its total photosynthetic energy production just for the nitrate conversion process alone. So this is a tremendous energy drain on the plant and it slows the plant down significantly. It, it produces a significant yield drag effect that has been unrecognized largely in mainstream agriculture. Okay, now let's look at the opposite end of the spectrum. The opposite end of the spectrum of nitrogen use efficiency is when plants absorb what I will just generically term as organic nitrogen. These are amino acids and peptides and proteins that come from living organisms, from living bacteria in the soil profile. When plants absorb these living organisms and amino acids and peptides and so forth, these might, what I refer to as microbial metabolites, when they absorb microbial metabolites, the exact opposite happens. They actually contribute energy to the plant. They don't extract energy. There is no photosynthase required. There's no sugar required for the, for the conversion process. And there's no additional water requirement. So you can actually reduce the water requirements of a crop by as much as 30% simply by having this very active microbiome supplying all of the plant's nutritional requirements. And then um, what this means for plant immunity uh, is that in the plant health pyramid at level three and level four of the plant health pyramid, these plants reach these levels because they have a surplus of energy. That's a very key phrase that I repeat over and over again. It's when plants have a surplus of energy and they will only reach the point where they have a surplus of energy when they begin absorbing the majority of their nutrition as microbial metabolites, not as simple ions. Wow. That's so well explained. I love it. Um, okay, so next question. AEA, you sell a lot of products for farmers, but you often say there's more important things to get right prior to worrying about plant nutrition. Could you give a brief list of priorities? And does, do you recall what I'm referring to? Yeah, so I, I wouldn't necessarily say that um, there are things we should consider before giving consideration to plant nutrition, but in conjunction with, there are, there are okay. many things that um, we need to pay close attention to um, and that are a required foundation in order for plant nutrition to really work well. And I actually put together an entire webinar on this topic that is um, up on YouTube. And um, there are a few fundamental things. Uh, obviously, I think the, the, op, the foundational principles of soil health, keeping the plant with soil covered with green photosynthesis, photosynthesizing plants all the time, using cover crops and so forth. Some of those things are fundamental. Specifically for high value fruit and vegetable crop production or wherever, um, in any context where we're using irrigation, managing irrigation water quality is extremely important and is a fundamental point that is so often missed. Irrigation water quality can actually have a bigger impact on plants than soil quality and soil health. Um, so uh, th there are some of those pieces that need to be taken into consideration, but um, the important point that I would like to make though is that most of us don't really know what healthy plants actually look like anymore. And that means that we don't know how to manage healthy plants. And uh, I've been sharing a series of blog posts recently. I'm going to keep expanding this series of just what healthy plants actually look like. I've, I've shared some photos of healthy blueberries and healthy um, radishes and healthy peas and so forth. And I'm going to keep expanding this list. But what farmers invariably discover is that 
certain plant growth characteristics that they have come to think of as being a normal are only normal for unhealthy plants. And when you, when you change the photosynthesis from let's say 20% to significantly higher, 40 to 60%, the plant's expression changes. And now that means perhaps you need to begin pruning a bit differently. Perhaps you need to begin planting a bit differently. Uh, and so this, we really need to look as we, as we increase the overall ecosystem performance, in many cases, when, when we reach these thresholds, of these higher levels of performance, that means that we need to change the way that we're managing our crops with cultural management practices, planting and weed control and pruning and so forth. All of a sudden, we find that we need to shift those slightly, and they're not the same as they were in the past because we have a plant that behaves differently than it did in the past. I have one follow-up question. Um, could you speak a little bit to the importance of biodiversity? Um, I think there's a lot of conversations about biodiversity, whether it's biodiversity of plants on a farm, biodiversity of, you know, the soil microbial life, you know, beneath, you know, in the soil. Um, obviously, you were saying that many people think, um, you know, to do just one crop year after year, you can't improve soil. You said something contrasting to that. So I'm just, yeah, I would just love to know your perspective and how you relate to biodiversity and its importance um, on a farm. I think my comment can be really simple and brief. Uh, biodiversity is an imperative whenever possible. Um, there are some cropping contexts and environments where it isn't easily possible, but for the majority, it is possible. We should seek to have a diversity of plants and uh, as diverse an ecosystem as possible. Yes, absolutely. It, you mentioned uh, blueberries in your last uh, comment, and there was uh, a video from Bob Wiltz um, from 2014 on your YouTube channel. We'll show a link for our listeners, and um, I just love that video. It's got blueberries, raspberries, and blackberries, and they're just astounding pictures. I mean. The, the yields that he's getting are, are phenomenal. And then uh, I know that most organic blueberries grown today, they're now doing it in plastic buckets filled with substrates. Are you gonna be able to get anything close to the quality that Bob Wilt's getting when you're growing your organic blueberries in a synthetic substrate with uh, nutrients, but it's, it's, you know, it's classified as organic? Another fun polarizing question, no? <laughs> um, so I would begin with the premise of saying that the, the ultimate expression of plant health as, as we, as I understand it from a very practical perspective is plants that are resistant to diseases and insects as a result of having an active immune system and they are at level four in the plant health pyramid. So if we, uh, state that objective as the ultimate desired outcome. These are going to be the blueberries that are very flavorful. They have an awesome aroma, an awesome flavor. They're really nutritious. They're really good for you. Um, can you achieve that outcome in a substrate in a container? Um, first, I would say that I don't believe it's impossible. It's uh, the question is, uh, I, I mentioned a moment ago that it is imperative we have a good microbiome and that the plant is absorbing the majority of its nutrition in the form of microbial metabolites. I believe that that container can be managed in a way to produce that outcome. It can be more challenging in some regards and easier in other regards, but I believe that is a possible outcome. I also believe that the way most of these plants are managed today with a, 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 a being fed a solution of simple ions precludes that possibility. So it is possible, but not the way many of these systems are being, being managed and run today. And there's also, it's, it's interesting that you should choose blueberry plants to make this comparison because um, surprisingly, there are, there are many plants that can adapt to these environments and be really healthy in these environments. Again, when they're managed correctly and they're managed in a regenerative fashion, um, when you think about the environment that blueberries are adapted to, they are natively adapted to growing in a peat bog. So is that really so different from growing in a peat or a choir-based container? 
Um, so the answer is, it's, I believe it is possible to produce those levels of plant health in a container uh, and grown in media. But uh, for some crops, it's going to be more difficult. And for all crops, it's going to be impossible when they're fed a nutrient solution of simple ionic fertilizers. Great. Thank you for taking the polarization out of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you interviewed Dr. Michael McNeil on your podcast, and he talks about transitioning large farms. He's also in your book. Um, he's talking about transitioning large farms to regenerative ag by going cold turkey, right? Just stopping applying all toxins. Of course, he has a, a talk with the farmers and says, you have to read this book and understand why you're doing this. And he claims that he hasn't had any failures with farmers that have just completely just stopped doing the you know standard traditional agriculture and switched over to more regenerative practices. Um, how, what are your thoughts on that as far as you know, going cold turkey? Well, I'm not surprised by the success and the outcomes that Michael is reporting um, for, for two significant reasons. One is it's important for us to understand the context. Michael is working mostly with broad acre farmers in the Midwest, which certainly have disease and, and insect challenges, but perhaps not to the same degree as uh, someone growing a high value fruit and vegetable crops in uh, some climatically challenged areas. So I think the context is important to understand that. Um, and I will, I will also say that um, at AEA, we have worked with growers, with commercial fruit and vegetable growers. And in fact, um, I just had a conversation an hour ago with a strawberry grower in Florida that um, has applied no fungicides so far this season. I uh, didn't tell, this is the first that I'm hearing about it. I didn't know that he was going to do fungicide applications, but he's applied no fungicides and all of his neighbors have applied 16 fungicide applications. Wow. So, um, Yes, context is important, but I believe that it is possible in all environments, in any environment, if you're willing to manage nutrition intensively enough to balance it. So that's the first point that I would make. The second point is that um, the piece that we often fail to appreciate is that many, or I shouldn't say many, in fact, I think it's safe to say all, all of these pesticides actually switch a plant from a healthy state a, in a protein synthesis state to an unhealthy state. In other words, they increase disease and insect susceptibility. This was first described by Francis Chaboso in his book, Healthy Crops, published back in the uh, early 1970s. And so one of the first things that we ask our growers to do or begin having a conversation about, I shouldn't say one of the first things, but one of the things that we start having a conversation about at some point is to say that uh, we should no longer apply pesticides proactively as a preventative because they're not. They actually increase susceptibility. And I could share hundreds of stories of actual in-field experiences and evidence where we have observed this. Um, just recently, uh, a few months ago, we had an onion grower that applied an herbicide in between his onion rows. And uh, there was a small amount of drift that the, some of the onion leaves were exposed to. And uh, this was with a selective herbicide that didn't damage the onions. And six weeks go by, and this farmer has an outbreak of thrips but only on the old leaves that were present and that were exposed to the herbicide, not on the new leaves. So this is, and that is one example, and I'm not exaggerating when I say I could give you hundreds, when uh, as an indicator where we can say that in many cases, pesticide applications actually create and amplify disease and insect susceptibility. So I'm not surprised to hear Michael say that he has significant successes with growers just as in the term that he used, just jumping off the cliff. They just stop completely right. because they're no longer creating their own susceptibility. When you stop to think about it, I think a lot of this was, was uh, unintentional and inadvertent on the part of pesticide producing companies and salespeople. They didn't fully realize the unintended second and third order consequences. 
but in hindsight, it's a brilliant marketing plan. You first create the problem and then you sell the solution to the problem. Right, right. All right. Um, yeah, I, I find all your conversations with him fascinating. Um, if you had to choose between a cover crop and compost to improve your soil, which would you choose and why? I don't have to choose. I can have both. <laughs> yeah, I knew it. Okay. <laughs> um, so um, I would suggest, though, that uh, our relationship with my personal relationship and ideas around compost have evolved over the years. Um, when I first started doing consulting work, I would have loved to have access to more compost because obviously it's a great resource. It's a great material. Um, many of the that we're working with on a scale of thousands of acres or tens of thousands of acres, there simply wasn't the compost available. And so we had to adapt. We had to figure out how to overcome and to uh, produce the outcomes that we were seeking without the compost applications. And as a result of that pathway and the learning that we have done since then, I've actually come to the point where we use and recommend less compost rather than more. And the reason for that is because I think generally it is a very expensive source of other things that you can get better in other places for the most part with a few exceptions. So let me expand on that, uh, what I mean by that. So the first and the obvious piece is carbon, building organic matter. Um, there's the idea that we should add compost to help build our soils and help build organic matter. And this might be appropriate if you're talking about a garden context, but not in a broad scale agricultural context. When you sit down and do the math of and you calculate the quantity of carbon that a really healthy crop can sequester and can move into the soil profile. For a corn crop, depending on the variety and, and which region of the country we're talking about, we're talking about anywhere from 10 to 15,000 pounds of carbon per acre, not carbohydrates, but actual carbon, measured C. And you cannot economically afford to put on enough compost to compete with that. And remember that we want to have higher organic matter in these agricultural soils because we want to cycle more, we want to release more. So um, the most efficient and cost-effective way for a commercial scale grower to rapidly sequester carbon is to increase the crop that he is growing, to increase its photosynthesis by using foliar applications of nutrients to spike the photosynthetic process and to temporarily accelerate it. And that's the most economical, the most cost effective, and it has the most significant ecosystem impacts. So today, where the way that I think about compost today is that it is a valuable and useful microbial inoculant. So it, is, it certainly has its place, and I'm not discounting the need for compost at all, but I think of it as being a microbial inoculant rather than as a source of carbon and rather than as a source of nutrients, even nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, there might be, again, this is context dependent, and on some soils, some cropping systems, you may need some phosphorus and potassium, but if you have a healthy ecosystem, you should never need nitrogen. When we are successful in building and rapidly sequestering these high volumes of carbon, the counterpart to that is that we accelerate soil biology to such a degree that we also begin fixing lots of nitrogen and we can supply 100% of a plant's nutritional requirements or nitrogen requirements from biology. Farmers should not need to buy nitrogen and it's fairly easy to turn the biology around to deliver all of that. That is so amazing. Most people don't remember their high school or earlier biology or chemistry and that the air is 78% nitrogen. So they're surprised, what, how could we, how could we grow plants without nitrogen? Where is it going to come from? When it's coming from the 78% in the air, as you described, yeah. 35,000 yeah. tons of you know, the 10,000 feet of atmosphere above every acre. And when you have good gas exchange and airflow into the soil, that nitrogen gas is consumed by biology and is converted to usable forms of nitrogen that the plants can absorb and can utilize. There is, there is, I mean, 
where do where do plants in the forest get their nitrogen from? Where do trees get their nitrogen from? I mean, we're growing a tree that weighs tons. It's not getting any nitrogen applied. It's coming from the atmosphere. And we can do the same thing and we can accelerate that natural process in our agricultural ecosystems. Excellent. Uh, Don, we're coming, we're coming up to, we have time for maybe, because I have one kind of uh, question that we ask every podcast. So you have one more question and then we're going to go to our okay, final good. question. I, I have to get to his book, the whole point here. So you're just releasing your book called Quality Agriculture, which contains transcripts of just a small portion of your, all your podcasts. And I feel it should be required reading for everyone, farmers, consumers, politicians, did you have a specific audience in mind? The original purpose and the intent of the podcast was that on my discovery pathway of learning about these agricultural ecosystems and trying to connect all the dots, I learned that there were many fascinating scientists and growers who had gained deep insights into what was really going on. And there were some of these people who were not widely known. Uh, that they, they weren't their, their message had not been shared with a, a large audience at all. And then there were other people who were more widely known, but they often didn't get to have the really deep conversations. So I wanted to, my intent for the podcast was to bring these people together and to try to draw out the information and the experiences that they had gleaned that was unique to them and to make it widely available for everyone. So the the audience that we intended this information for was professional growers and their advisors, uh, particularly agronomists and so forth. So it has a particular agronomic bent and focus, of course, um, but really uh, it's, it's designed for a professional audience, but to be simple and easy to understand and very accessible. And it's equally applicable to homesteaders and gardeners and small market farmers. It's, uh, you can apply the information in any context. Awesome. All right. Um, Ryan, I've got this, the last question. I swear this is the last one, but what has you most excited about the future of ag? I'm excited about lots of things. I'm excited about the progress and the momentum of regenerative agriculture. Um, I would say there are two particular elements that I'm really excited about. One of them is that um, we need no new information to change agriculture globally. Mm. We already have the knowledge, we have the information. I'm using the collective we, we as a community at large. Um, there are certainly additional things that we would like to learn, that we would like to know, and, and there's lots of opportunities for more learning. I'm not discounting that at all, but we already know enough. We know enough to rapidly regenerate agriculture. I'm really excited about that. And this next comment may come as a surprise, Benjamin Franklin used to say that nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And that is true of this comment is, I'm actually excited about, or I think we could, we can be excited about the fact that um, there is a large amount of land turnover happening in the US. The, the, the largest land turnover that has existed in history is happening in the next 10 to 15 years to a, an emerging generation of farmers. And in this sense, we can perhaps even be happy about the fact that there is a crisis because perhaps the crisis can precipitate progress and positive change. So there is a crisis and I feel for the people who are caught up in it. Um, and and I, I would like to, I'm going to expand on this point just a little bit. Um, dairy farmers have particularly been hard hit recently in, in recent years with lots of bankruptcies, lots of people going out of business. Uh, the system as it exists right now, um, there, it could be argued that it is stacked against them. And I, I empathize with that. At the same time that there are hundreds of dairy farmers going out of business, I have many personal friends of dairy farmers who are, they're not making as much money as they were in the past, but they're being very successful. Last year, 2019 growing season, um, I know a young dairy farmer who I'm good friends with. He's milking about 70 cows, organically certified. He made a net profit of over $200,000 on a small 80-acre farm. 
Mm. He's 100% grass fed. He grows no, no corn, feeds no corn. He says, I can't afford to grow and feed corn because it costs him too much. So his cost of production is less than $5 a hundred weight. Uh, the mainstream cost of production is pushing $15 per hundred weight. So I empathize with, with the growers who are and, and consu- uh, producers who are going bankrupt. And at the same time, I would point out that this is a result of the choices that you have made in the past and are making today. You are choosing to continue to grow corn silage and to stay stuck in the system that you know and are familiar with. If you desire to be profitable, if you desire the next generation to, to want to continue farming, there are people who are doing it successfully that you can choose to emulate if you wish to. So uh, going out of business is a result of our personal choices. We can't blame anyone else for that. We can't blame the government. We can't blame the weather. It's a result of the choices that we've made. All right. Wow. Right. It's all yours. Uh, uh, I'm just, one, I'm just present to being completely uh, returned on by, you know, like, this, this has been another Graham State conversation. So I just want to say thank you, John. This has been extraordinary and illuminating. And uh, I'm excited for our listeners to hear this conversation. Uh, the podcast is called We Can Do This because really we've been holding a very similar view that you've been communicating, which is this is possible, uh, that we can turn this around. Um, and the question is, how can we do this? And you've said it in many ways over the podcast, but we like to end with, um, John, how can we do this? <laughs> I think um, what I've really come away with over the years is uh, kind of boils down to two things, uh, learning and sharing information. So my advice to myself and to everyone else would be surround yourself with like-minded peers, even if they're not in your immediate community and in close proximity, if they're a couple hours away or further Find people that you can really connect with. Build a peer group around yourself that you can rely on for support. And then learn and share what you have learned with others. Because the fastest way to learn is is to try to teach something to someone else. Mm. And so in that spirit, I would invite all of our listeners to uh, my, I, I put that into practice with a blog that as much as possible, I try to post five posts a week, one every morning. So I would invite you to go to johnkempf.com. Please subscribe to the blog. And then when you find the information valuable and useful, please share it with others. Pass it on. That's the most valuable and important thing you can do. Mm, I love that. The, the, and it's so profound, beautiful, speaks right to where I am in my life. Uh, you know, we started this podcast uh, just a couple months ago. And really one of the instructions that my mom gave me was to share love and information. And um, so that really has been one of the intentions of this podcast. And you have so eloquently and beautifully shared love and your love um, and information that is illuminating and inspiring. And so I just want to thank you, you know, from um, sincerely from my heart uh, for the, the path that you've walked and the learning that you've done such that you can share such beautiful information uh, with so many people. And uh, yeah, I just want to, um, I'm excited to continue to build a relationship between Kiss the Ground and what you're doing. Um, and and yeah, one thing that we always want to end with um, that we can do this podcast is just encouraging. Um, if you're inspired by the work of Kiss the Ground or you're inspired by this podcast, uh, please become a member of Kiss the Ground. And uh, we, in the, in the state of, you know, the world right now and how the economy, many people are, have been laid off, we've made our membership available for as low as $1. Um, you can become a member of Kiss the Ground. So we just invite you, if you're a new listener, to please become a member of Kiss the Ground. Um, and, uh, and as John has uh, recommended, let's all go sign up for his um, uh, blog and uh, we'll have stuff in the show notes of how you can connect, connect further with John Kemp's amazing um, work. So thank you so much. Thank you, Don, for inspiring this conversation and for facilitating many of the questions. And uh, yeah, it's been a real honor to be with you gentlemen and have a beautiful rest of your day. It's, thank been, you an very much. it's been an honor to be here and an enjoyable conversation. Thanks for having me and for doing your work in making a difference. Let's go make a ruckus. All right. Thank you so much. All right.